Hi, welcome to a foreigner in the Philippines, and um, I'm guessing what is could pass as a late night meandering. Haven't done one of those for a little while, where I wander off into my own little world. My mother always used to say, Terence, you're in a world of your own. And, uh, and happily, I, I am in a world of my own. But we're looking at what we call reality. Eh. And reality is, um, is really a quite a strange thing. Uh, the more that they find out about supposed or uh, the uh, supposed sense of reality that we all have, uh, the, the more confusing the situation actually becomes because it starts to conflict with normal, what we shall say, normal uh, perceptions uh, of what is real. And uh, I always liked that joke, actually, uh, of the of the hairdresser, and she's brushing and treating the hair of someone, and she says, "Actually, you're one of the few people with normal hair," <laughs> because nowadays, if you buy shampoo, you don't just buy shampoo for washing. It doesn't just say wash your hair. It it is. Um, for tangled hair, it is for black hair, it's for treated hair, it's for blonde hair, it's it's uh, all kinds of things and it has all different kinds of fabulous words like keratin and, um, and other mysterious substances which are put into what amounts to soap in order to clean your hair. So looking at reality and what is supposedly real we, let me see, it says here Lily Tomlin and Jane Wagner, uh, they said, I, I don't quite know how Lily and Jane got together and had a united thought, but uh, apparently they did, and they said reality is nothing more than a collective hunch. Now you remember what a hunch was, that was what the old, uh, the, the, the cops in Hollywood movies, they always had a hunch that the, the whole movie would be based on a, a hunch, and that is the uh, the intuitive thought that someone had that something wasn't quite as it should be, and and that was what uh, that was the whole premise of the movie was based on that. Well, he had a hunch. Oh no! Now oh, don't tell me this again, officer. You've got another one of your hunches. Yes, Superintendent, I really feel I've got a hunch on this, and uh, it's not as we think. Okay, so, William James, who I'm sure that you're as familiar with him as I was. William James said, Our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. So in other words, a consciousness that we normally perceive as ours, uh, the way that things are, just underneath it, in, in the, the thinnest, thinnest membrane of different way of looking at it, is a whole other kind of consciousness. We may go through life without suspecting their existence, but apply the requisite stimulus and at a touch they are there in all their completeness. They forbid a premature closing of our accounts with reality. Closing our accounts, in other words, we're, we're not going to part this world with the same sense of reality as we came into it with. See, we always talk about how children grow up and they grow up with a, a sense of reality. And where do they get that from? Well, they usually get it from teachers, from friends, uh, teachers, friends and relatives, both close and distant. And the things that mom sent, said to you when you were a little kid and perhaps you had been naughty, uh, they stay with you. Uh, some, some are damaging, some are smart. If your mother used to say, well, a stitch in time saves nine, uh, well, yes, that's, uh, that's true, isn't it? That can be seen to be true. And 
but then there were others where they said no one will ever understand you oh gosh go through life with that as a little belief that you have buried under the surface and they're like these beliefs are almost like splinters if you've ever worked with wood and then uh, actually you don't have to have worked with wood if you've ever run your hand down a banister or across or on a, a seat somewhere uh, and you get a tiny tiny sliver of wood and it goes into the skin and sometimes you think you've got it all out but then sometimes sometimes weeks sometimes months later the thing starts to feel bad and if and if you get a pin and start poking around you'll find that there's another piece of that splinter is in there that's how I think of these beliefs that have been slipped in under the skin so to speak and you've been going along thinking that they're not there and that the belief is yours all along and it turns out that it might be a very damaging belief now whenever we listen to anything we listen to a story and we have a certain expectation if you're one of those sharp people who can listen to a joke and realize what the the, uh, the punchline is going to be uh, and still laugh well you're lucky but most people will listen to uh, listen to a story and they will they will start to form uh, opinions about or beliefs about how this is going to end and the, all the time they're they're working through it that's why a whodunit is so very good um, if you ever if you ever watched a, a movie um, the three little indians or something i think it was called and uh, these people are gathered together into a house uh, for the weekend and they start getting killed one by one and you're supposed to work out who did it uh, and it's never the butler remember the standing joke well the butler did it so you have these ideas I remember as a musician musicians have really great jokes they do have great jokes and um, but it's a dark sense of humor but this particular big band were looking for a trumpet player um, uh, it was getting late in the day for the auditions and then a couple of people a couple of people walked in one of them was a very sharp looking guy uh, he was very sharply dressed looked looked and talked really intelligent and and everybody quite liked him as well and so they were looking forward to hearing him and he was the last he was the last one to be auditioned so they watched him unpack his instrument which was a top of the line trumpet that had cost a lot of money and it was polished beautifully and he put his mouthpiece in and they put the piece of music up and he played brilliantly they said this is it we have found our trumpet player and he starts packing his instrument away and uh, he's already walked out the door everybody's completely happy but then this ragged looking guy walks in the door and says am I too late for the auditions uh, his trumpet is wrapped in um, a few old newspapers and finished off with a piece of brown paper uh, and he wasn't very well dressed and he didn't look much well they really didn't have the heart to say no sorry it's it's done because they didn't want him to think nice guys in this particular band they didn't want him to think that just because of how he looked that they were judging him so they said okay please so he laid his bundle of newspapers down on the table and he unwrapped it and the trumpet was in a sorry state but anyway he put the trumpet to his lips they set the music up and in they came 
and he blew. And he sounded bloody awful. Hence the joke. So they obviously... Now, at this point in time, in the joke, uh, Beth would say to me, what happened then? <laughs> we all have a different sense of humour, don't we? So, we're looking at the idea that as we move along, based on certain perceptions that we already have, that we have now decided, you and I have decided, that some of the things that we're told are actually not very factual. My father, when I was a kid, I'd left school and the local music store was also a place where they made instruments. And after school, as, as a, a kid, I used to make it my business to walk past this place. And in the window was uh, a treasure trove of things for my young eyes. And I would look at trumpets and trombones and flutes and and basses, tubers and uh, and all kinds of stuff that they that they had either made or were selling and I would think that that was the most wonderful thing and then it turned out that they were looking for apprentices yes we're, we're talking a, a long time ago so I mentioned to my dad I said they're looking for people to learn how to make musical instruments and he said no you need to get a proper job and as a result of that I went into the coal mines <laughs> now, now you can see that the, my father's perception of what a job was was quite different to mine would mine have been better I don't know but as it turned out I didn't stay in the coal mines for very long at all. In fact, my father quickly realized that uh, what he had put his 15-year-old kid into was not really a great thing to be doing. Sorry, the camera suddenly drooped. I know the feeling. Well, anyway, I then was guilty uh, or was held to one of his other beliefs and he looked at me coming home uh, black with coal dust from the pit because at that time for trainees which is what I was they didn't have uh, they didn't have shower facilities until you actually started working as a pit as a, a, a miner so I would arrive home I hadn't been used to working in my young life and now I was doing physically hard demanding work and I would get home and I would be just exhausted so he took it upon himself to write to a band the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders military band because they were advertising for young students boy soldiers uh, no experience was needed and they would give you training. So they train you to be a musician and to be a member of the band. Um, now, I tried to join the Navy a little bit before that, but never got through the particular exam that they gave me. So I'd failed on that. Instead of studying up and going back and doing what I really wanted to do, I didn't do that. I took the failure as being final, which is another belief, isn't it? You fail on something and you think that that's the end of it. And it's not. It's uh, only the beginning. So it came through that the bandmaster of the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders said, we'd be delighted to have your son. Oh boy, would they ever. Um, tell him to go to the local recruiting office and tell, tell them that he has been accepted for the band of the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders, which I did. And I took the test there, and the test was such at that time for the army uh, and the infantry at that, uh, such that uh, the IQ of an average uh, dining room uh, chair was, was enough to get through that. 
So I ended up in the army. And then as I began to learn new things, I began to change the way that I thought. And the way that I thought had all kinds of impossibilities in it. And maybe you are the same. Maybe, maybe you're a nurse or a doctor or, I don't know, maybe you're a musician by mistake. But so many people are what they are by mistake, by preconceived ideas, not of their own, but of their parents. I went round yesterday and we met a friend, Alvin, and he has three children now. These are bright children, and Alvin is uh, an educated, uh, successful man, now retired in the Philippines. And he is making assessments of the kind of job that any of these children will eventually have. And the oldest boy is the most obvious. Uh, and Alvin believes and will guide accordingly that the boy will become an engineer because he's good at math and he's good at mechanics. I think that that was the idea. So there you have a situation where someone is being guided well. That's what I would assume. My father didn't ask me did I want to be in a band. He didn't ask. He, he assumed that because because I was interested in very interested in music and loved music that I would I would be interested in going in a band. I'm 15 years old. What am I going to say, Dad? You're wrong. I, I don't think so. So I went in and I signed on for six years. Six years when you're 15. Six irrevocable, non-refundable non years. And the other, the crux of it was that that six years did not begin until I was 18 years old. So two and a half years for nothing. And that's what I did. And a few times I tried to change and do something else. But I always ended up that, well, when you're in the army, they don't ask you what you want to do. When I went in, I went to the nearest, they put me through to the nearest boys, uh, boys camp. And I wanted to play the trumpet. But came back from the band, because this was not the band itself, it was a, a place where boys went. Uh, and they said, no. No, we don't have a vacancy for a trumpet player. And so the kids around me said, oh, go for the trombone. The trombone's a great instrument. I had no idea what a trombone looked like. Uh, so I said, okay. And they said, make it the tenor trombone, not the bass trombone. So once again, I took somebody else's idea and I utilized it in my own life. And I became a trombone player against my will very 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 first choice was a trumpet so I'm a trombone player um, and then recently I read that this is not unusual that many people who have made incredible successes of their lives as a certain thing didn't start off wanting to do that and still harbour uh, a longing for doing that other thing and these were they interviewed people that were famous for what they did you know great great violinists great opera singers people who had achieved great success in what they did and yet actually they wanted to do something else I don't know maybe the Chan of Pavarotti wanted to be a cook I mean, he's a big guy, isn't he? They're, they're usually cooks. So that's maybe that's what he wanted to be. James Galway was, a, was a, a flute player, a flautist. He called himself a flute player or flutist. And he may have wanted to be a footballer. 
I remember a fellow trombone player. He wanted to be a golfer and he gave up and he actually went to play golf. Uh, reality came around when he realized that actually he was well suited for playing the trombone and not so well suited for playing the golf club. So we're all on journeys which we probably never wanted to set foot in. And, you know, for myself, I always had an aptitude for the trombone. It just turned out that it was completely by accident. Well, maybe. But destiny had led me to play the trombone. But actually, I wanted to be a singer. So, as time went by, and I managed to also include singing. And I did that by virtue of the fact that I began to run my own bands. And then, well, I damn well said, if I wanted to sing, I, I'm going to sing. Not everybody was very happy with that, and it took me a while to get some credibility. But I took lessons and worked hard, and it kind of worked out in the end. The point I'm making is, I guess, if there is a point, is that we may be in uh, lives that are not really ours. And what we think of as being real may not be real at all. That they, that they are simply a veneer which is covering the real thing. You know, my favourite example of, of how a belief can be a national, uh, can be a human belief held by all, the one that strikes me is the four minute mile. And I understand that the Greeks, who were the great athletes, right, didn't they originate the idea of the Olympics? The Greeks came to the conclusion, based on their extensive knowledge of athletics, that the human body was incapable of a four-minute mile. They could, it could not break the four-minute mile because of genetics. It was, uh, it seemed an obvious thing to them, and. How long did that go? How many years was it ago? Um, I think it was in something like maybe the 50s. Somebody will correct me on this. But Roger Bannister, uh, who apparently was a doctor, um, he broke the record of the four-minute mile. Now, as soon as it became broken, as soon as it, the law was re-established, now you have college kids in America and the world over and they are breaking the four minute mile which was which was actually enforced by belief for hundreds and hundreds of years. So you can see that we are all of us going along, basing what we think is real on something which may be just accepted, learned helplessness. What's the, what's the idea of learned helplessness of where we've accepted that something is abs absolutely true and it's not. And of course they, they talk about the, the dog, the dog that when the people got this dog, they, they, they bought uh, a British Bulldog. Excuse me. They brought a British Bulldog, which will grow to be 130, 140 pounds. Almost as much as, well, as much as me. And they realised that the one thing that they couldn't have, because they had lots of visitors, was a dog that jumped up at people. You know that thing of, the dog keeps jumping up. I have a dog that just keeps jumping up and licking you. Well, so what they did was, when they got this tiny puppy, they put a collar on him and a leash, and they put the 
loop of the handle of the leash under a chair. Just a, an ordinary uh, wing back easy chair which probably weighed I don't know 50 pounds. So 50 pounds the dog pulled against it and pulled and pulled and pulled until it got exhausted uh, and then it stopped and then the next day they put the leash on the under the leg and the dog pulled and pulled over time it was a bright dog and it got the it got the message it now knew that there was no use in trying to get away from that chair because as soon as it saw the leash go under the chair it knew that that was it I'm here for the duration until I'm released of course when it became 150 pounds in fact it could have pulled that chair all around the room but it had learned helplessness it knew it knew as a fact that it could not move that chair how did it know well it had learned over time and the one thing that it couldn't allow for was its increased weight and strength so it never got the message I guess had uh, the wrong dog or the wrong cat walked into the room uh, when it was tethered it may have changed its mind and pulled that chair around and then learned but it didn't learned helplessness that's the concept <clears throat> and we've all got some kind of learned helplessness and it's a it's a a bugbear for me it's it's one of those things that I just don't like it and people write constantly and they are as that bulldog they're they've learned helplessness and they've learned all kinds of stuff they've learned that they are the heritage that has been given to them that they are uniquely Irish Scottish uh, English um, Western that they are white that they are black they're brown they're whatever they are and they've learned that everything that goes with being that is theirs can't help it you know what was that movie white white men can't jump so what have we got we've got the situation where all of us nobody gets away with this all of us have limiting beliefs and the limiting beliefs have been given to us down the line and we've learned them we've learned helplessness according to that belief we bought into it we bought into the idea that we're not musicians we bought into the idea that we're not mathematicians that we're not we're not doctors that we're not lawyers heaven forbid um, so all of these things we just simply bought into and we bought into the four minute mile is impossible we bought into all kinds of stuff and we need to buy out of it and the only thing that any of us can do is to find our own limit, limiting beliefs and once we find them that's the point at which we need courage because that's the point at which you have to say I'm not going to be limited by this belief any longer and that's where courage comes in because along with that limiting belief you usually have it enforced at the time that you bought it by fear by threat by overwhelm you know sometimes we think that we're unable to do something simply because somebody told us I remember I worked with a man who was a, a, a karate he was a lover of karate and worked quite hard at it he was actually a green belt in, uh, in 
a particular style called Kyokushinkai, which I did for a couple of years, without any great show of talent, by the way. Oh, is that one of my limiting beliefs? Heaven forbid. And this man revered one particular black belt who was within that style. And he knew him by name. He knew how he had worked. He had seen him in tournaments vanquish superior fighters. And his belief in the invincibility of that man was complete. Well, he told me the story how he went on. He was entered through his club into open freestyle uh, uh, tournaments. And there they would draw lots for who was to fight who and you took your chances. And he actually got through a couple of fights and then his name came up and to his horror he was grouped, pitted against his opponent who was his hero. And he almost made up his mind right there and then. Initially, how can I win? This man, I've seen him vanquish people that I could... How can I win? In other words, he was feeling the tug of the leash on the easy chair, so to speak. But something inside him then said, i got to do my best. Well, he knocked the other guy down and he won. Against his idol, he won. And so we can all break that leash. We can all break that tether that ties us to any given belief. We can break it. And that's the challenge in life, is to go along finding our limiting beliefs, those things that we fear, the, the dragons that we need to slay, and get out there and do battle or come to terms. It may be something as big as uh, being able to go up and ask a girl for a date. Some people are absolutely strangled by that. Maybe that they're not good looking enough or they're or something, I don't know. It's possible to get through these challenges and surprise yourself. And here's the thing, if you can do it on one, you can do it on the rest. And if you're religious, you'll know that God never gives us a challenge, problem, a dilemma, a something to face without somehow giving us the inner resources to be able to overcome that challenge. And I believe that. You can put your own interpretation on whether it's the universe, whether it is quantum physics, or whether it's the Lord. It's up to you to interpret that as you will. But you can overcome those things which you have long held are impossible. You can do it. And hey, my coffee's gone cold. Is that a limiting belief, do you think? That I can't drink cold coffee? Probably. This is a foreigner in the Philippines. Sorry I meandered too much, but then if it was too much for you, you won't be watching this. And if you're not watching it, who am I talking to? Life's never easy, is it? This is a foreigner in the Philippines. Like, comment, subscribe. Bye.